All right, guys, how's it going? It's getting on nearly two years since the release of my The GPU War Is Over video. That video covered a fascinating period in GPU history, between the years of maybe 2008, 2011, with more emphasis on the earlier years. I guess it was mostly fascinating simply due to the fact that AMD was winning, and by a very large margin. They had a huge lead in metrics like performance per watt and performance per dollar, and in the case of the HD5870, they held the fastest single GPU card for around about 6 months. That card had launched in September 2009. AMD had in fact held the title of world's fastest graphics card for well over 2 consecutive years. First of all with the 5970, which was a dual GPU card launching in November 2009. Then they followed up with the 6990, another dual GPU card which launched in March 2011. AMD didn't lose the overall fastest card title until Nvidia launched their GTX 690 in May 2012. So it's time for yet another history lesson, and I'm going to start this one by looking at how AMD was winning almost all of the big battles back then. So the story starts over at Anantech with the man himself's fantastic RV770 story, documenting ATI's road to success. On the first page, Anand moans about not being able to get access to AMD or ATI. DI's engineers, instead having to deal with marketing guys, like this young looking Chris Hook here. There's some interesting snippets on that part alone, however, the point of this article was that Anand indeed finally got the engineering access he desired, and after visiting ATI's office in Santa Clara, remember AMD had acquired ATI a couple of years earlier and was still integrating the company, he found himself in a room with AMD fellow after fellow smart guy after smart guy, and not a single member of AMD PR to muzzle the engineers. One of those engineers was Karel Killebrew, the engineering lead on RV770, which was the GPU behind the Radeon HD 4800 series, and he gave Anand three choices of topic. They could talk about future GPU trends and architectures, they could talk about GPU accelerated video transcoding, or he, along with the rest of the group, could give Anand the backstory on RV770. I would have had a really hard time choosing between options 1 and 3. Anand chose option 3 though, deciding to hear out the story of how AMD's RV770 came to be, and what Anand called the best meeting he'd ever had with AMD or ATI became one of the best, most fascinating tech articles ever written. It all started back in 2001, when ATI, still independent at that time, was working on the R300 GPU, that's the famous Radeon 9700 Pro. As Anand says, if you were following the industry at all back then, you would never forget the R300. Nvidia had steadily been gaining steam, and nothing ATI could do was enough to dethrone them, which meant that Nvidia's customers remained loyal to Nvidia. So ATI decided that in order to win the market, they had had to win the Halo. If ATI could produce the fastest GPU, they would get the brand recognition and loyalty. And in order to beat Nvidia, they had to build a large GPU. The previous ATI flagship, the Radeon 8500, and codenamed R200, was built on TSMC's 150 nanometer manufacturing process and it had around 60 million transistors, and we can see the card here. R300 would be built on the same 150 nanometer process, but this time with 110 million transistors, almost doubling the 8500 without having a die shrink. In various competition, the famous and infamous GeForce 4 series, depending on whether you bought the TI or the MX, it was only a 63 million transistor chip. Nvidia didn't dare to build something so big on the 150 nanometer node, so the GeForce 4 successor would instead be built on the more advanced 130 nanometer node. And those of you who watched my history of GeForce videos will know, R300 was eventually branded the ATI Radeon 9700 Pro, and it mopped the floor with the GeForce 4. The success with R300 solidified ATI's strategy. In order to beat Nvidia, they had to keep pushing the envelope for chip size. Each subsequent GPU would have to be bigger and faster at the high end. Begun these GPU wars had. But Nvidia's initial counterattack was a total flop. 
First the NV30, then later the NV35 chip headlined the woefully underperforming GeForce 5 FX series. Remember, they were on the newer 130nm node, but due to being a little bit smaller, they didn't have a much higher transistor count. ATI was still in the lead, and with an older process, but Nvidia aren't the kind of company to take it lying down. And the chips got huge. ATI were increasing die sizes, but they couldn't keep up with Nvidia's increases, each new chip reaching even more monstrous sizes. G80 in particular was a leviathan, an absolutely monstrous 484 square millimeter chip on the 90 nanometer process. ATI had no chance, they weren't even close. And to make matters worse, their huge counter chip R600 and the HD2000 series flopped just as badly as Nvidia's FX had four years earlier. So Nvidia was in complete control of the high end and ATI couldn't keep up with the increasing die sizes. Something had to change and that change was the sweet spot strategy. Instead of targeting the high end, AMD would now be targeting the sweet spots. The dollar marks where most people bought GPUs. Those ultra high end chips may be fast, but very few people bought them. They were just too expensive. And with the 8800 Ultra, Nvidia's prices had reached the obscene levels of $800 plus. Only the richest could dream of affording it. But think about what this meant. ATI won handsomely with R300 by going big. Now they were strongly considering going small again. In the end, that was the decision they took. AMD launched the relatively small RV670, the world's first 55 nanometer chip at only 192 square millimeters, and it headlined their HD3000 series as the HD3870. It was still no match for the enormous G80, with the 8800 series card still far ahead in most titles. Nvidia had decided to shrink G80 for G92, effectively the same chip on the newer 65 nanometer process, but it was still much larger than the RV670. Back in those days, scant regard was paid on stuff like die sizes and manufacturing nodes. It was all about what was fastest. Not even power was much of a concern, except in the worst cases like FX and HD2000. So back then, all that really mattered was the HD3870 lost quite heavily to the 8800. GT. But looking now at the difference in size, it's clear that AMD had something pretty good in terms of performance for die size, or performance per square millimeter. It was behind the 8800 GT in raw performance by 15%, while being 28% behind the GTX, which was the G80 flagship. But it was now obvious that a larger chip again could dramatically close the gap, or even more, to Nvidia. From Nvidia though, even more was what we got. It was pretty obvious that Nvidia would be staying on the 65 nanometer process, which meant they would be going big again with the mammoth 576 square millimeter GT200 and the flagship GTX 280. Unlike with G80, however, the performance gains were not massive, with the 280 only coming in around 60% faster than the 9800 GTX. Anand and Derek were clearly somewhat disappointed at this relatively low increase. Yes, 60% was low back then. We see this over at Tom's Hardware also, where they were underwhelmed by only 59%. Back at Anand Tech for the conclusion though, and with AMD dropping out of the high-end single GPU space, Nvidia will be left all alone with top performance for the foreseeable future. But as we saw from the benchmarks, that doesn't always work out quite like we would expect. For those of you that watched The GPU War Is Over, the rest is history. For those of you that didn't, AMD launched their 4800 series chips and they were very small compared to the huge GT. 200. Much more importantly though, the gap between the 280 and the 4870 was very small, less than 10% according to Anantech, with the HD 4870 further ahead of the heavily cut down GTX 260. Even more important than that though, the AMD cards were around half the price of their Nvidia competition. Nvidia had to cut prices dramatically a few weeks later, but as the GPU war is over video showed, they were still overpriced compared to the AMD competitors, but that didn't stop Nvidia from selling more cards and making much more money anyway. That is simply one thing, the power of the brand. The AMD were on a roll, technically at least, and less than 18 months later, another new architecture. Out went the old naming scheme of RV, then three numbers, in came a bunch of 
trees with the evergreen family headlined by Cypress, what we know better as the HD5870. Anand again covered this in another incredible article, the RV870 story, where once again he talked with Karel Killebrew. Anand also talks about how AMD wanted to change the codename, but he decided to go with RV870 anyway. Over a few pages and we learned that AMD had planned to go massive with the 5870. That's what made sense. With the much smaller 4870 being so close to Nvidia's humongous GTX 280, a much larger AMD chip would surely win by a huge margin on the new 40 nanometer node. This article is amazing for a bunch of reasons, but for me the main point was on how AMD and Nvidia dealt with the 40 nanometer node and it also said a lot about each set of engineers' capabilities back in those days. Cypress wasn't actually the first 40 nanometer GPU. And in the cost of jumping to 40 nanometers, Aaron starts off by saying that this part of the story could almost stand on its own. Before continuing over the next couple of pages to talk about the move to 40 nanometers and why it's been so difficult. In process versus architecture, the difference between ATI and Nvidia, Aaron states, Ever since NV30, which was the ill-fated GeForce FX series, Nvidia hasn't been first to transition to any new manufacturing process. Instead of dedicating engineers to process technology then, Nvidia chooses to put more of its resources into architecture design. And the flip side is true at ATI. ATI is much less afraid of new process nodes and thus devotes more engineering resources to manufacturing. Anand believes that neither approach is the right one and they both have their trade-offs. Nvidia's approach means that they can execute well on a mature process. However, it also means that between major process boundaries, for example 55 nanometers to 40 nanometers, they won't be as competitive as ATI. So Nvidia believed that they should let ATI take all of the risk jumping to the new process, and only once the process is mature would they switch over. That seems like a good deal for Nvidia, but it does mean that when it comes to a brand new process, ATI has more experience. And because ATI puts itself in the situation of having to jump to an unproven process earlier, they have to dedicate more engineers to process technology in order to mitigate the risk. Back then, ATI slash AMD and TSMC were working very closely on bringing up each new node, with ATI frequently being first to the new node period, not just compared to Nvidia, but compared to anyone. So the first 40 nanometer GPU and the first 40 nanometer chip period, I believe, was in fact RV740, a very small 137 square millimeter GPU. Nvidia's first 40 nanometer GPUs were even smaller and came in a few months later. The G210 and GT220 chips, which measured only 57 square millimeters and 100 square millimeters respectively. Anon speculated that the tiny G210 made up a good percentage of those orders. With the GT240, it would be 7 months later before Nvidia had a 40 nanometer chip of comparable size to RV740. So obviously, when it came time for both ATI and Nvidia to move their high performance GPUs to 40 nanometers, ATI had more experience and exposure to the problems with TSMC's process. David Wang, ATI's VP of Graphics Engineering at the time, had concerns about TSMC's 40 nanometer process that he voiced to Karel early on in the RV740 design process, being especially concerned that the metal handling in the fabrication process might lead to VIA quality issues. VIAs are tiny connections between the different metal layers on a chip, and Wang believed that the VIA failure rate at 40 nanometers was high enough to impact the yield of the process. And even if the VIAs wouldn't fail completely, the quality of the VIA would degrade the signal going through the VIA. The problem with VIAs was actually easy, but costly to get around. Wang simply decided to double up on VIAs with the RV740. At any point in the design where there was a VIA that connected two metal layers, they were doubled up. And of course that made the chip bigger than normal, but that's better than having chips that wouldn't work. As for Nvidia, they simply didn't have the 40 nanometer experience that ATI did. And they actually spoke out against TSMC, calling for zero via defects. Nvidia's John Chen zeroed in on VIAs, calling via deposition a major reliability concern. A chip with 3.2 billion transistors has 7.2 billion VIAs. We have to make all the VIAs work, 
it has to be defect free. But a much worse problem, Chen said, is when vias degrade over time, causing chips to fail in the field. Our biggest issue is poison vias, Chen said. Adding that, at the 40 nanometer node, voids in the copper can cause some vias to eventually become open. We need absolutely zero defects on the 7.2 billion vias, so we don't get returns from the customers. ATI's previous experience on 40 nanometers made them realize that the bigger the chip, the more the vias, the more likely that one is gonna fail. This huge plant RV870 was chopped down to a far more manageable size and the vias were doubled up. Nvidia, on the other hand, had always planned to release Fermi. They had no plan B, according to their own CEO, Jensen Huang. And we already knew what Fermi would be because history told us. Fermi was planned as an absolutely huge GPU. Anything less would have been completely killed by the 5870. And after months and months of delays, Fermi finally launched as the same absolutely huge 530 square millimeter GPU with frightening power consumption and performance only just faster than the 5870. AMD's lead was so much that even the dual chip 5970 mentioned at the start of this video had lower power consumption and vastly higher performance than the GTX 480. Nvidia blamed TSMC while AMD simply engineered around the issues. AMD's reward though was barely 50% of the market and also at much cheaper prices than their Nvidia counterparts. But something was still missing from AMD's absolute domination plan. The 5870 held the lead for around 6 months, but it was ultimately usurped by the huge GTX 480's brutal brute force approach, as Nvidia tended to do to remain on top. Fermi went on to be probably the biggest GPU meme ever, but it was still faster, regardless of its astronomical power consumption. It was of course only faster because of its sheer size however, and AMD had plenty of room to grow in 40 nanometers, while Nvidia, they could only really hope to fix Fermi's worse problems. Before that though, AMD signaled their intent with yet another new architecture, codenamed BARTS, for the 6800 series. These chips were small and extremely power efficient, matching Fermi GTX 470 at less than half the power and die size. AMD's choice of naming was very controversial at the time, with the 6870 falling a little short of the 5870 in performance, but on a technical level, AMD were further ahead of Nvidia than at any previous point in history, save perhaps for the R300. What happened next though was not the beginning of the end for Nvidia, it was in fact the beginning of the end of AMD's dominance. Everybody waited, expecting the incoming 6970 to destroy the 480 by a huge distance, with Nvidia having nowhere to go. But Nvidia actually proved they still had some capability left by fixing almost all of the 480's problems, launching with a slightly faster, lower power consumption GTX 580. It would still clearly not have enough performance to withstand AMD's 6970 though. All AMD had to do was come back with their own large GPU on TSMC's now fixed 40 nanometer process. But that was never AMD's plan. AMD instead had planned to relentlessly move on to the next node again, the 32 nanometer node. And the 6970 wasn't supposed to be a huge GPU, but another medium sized GPU. This was AMD's sweet spot strategy. But as you just learned, there are risks with being first to new nodes. And the risk on 32 nanometer was the greatest risk of all, as TSMC cancelled it in late 2009. AMD were already far along with their 32 nanometer designs, both BARTS, the 6800 series GPU, and Cayman, the codename for the 6900 series GPU. The 32 nanometer predecessor of BARTS was among the earlier projects to be sent to 40 nanometers. And this was due to the fact that before 32 nanometers was even cancelled, TSMC's pricing was going to make 32 nanometers more expensive per transistor than 40 nanometers anyway. And obviously that is a problem for a mid-range part like BARTS, where AMD has specific margins that they would like to hit. Cayman, on the other hand, was going to be a high-end part, and high-end parts carry higher margins of course. So it still made sense to stick with 32 nanometers, and AMD did right up until the very end. But the end result was that Cayman was a compromise, backported to make it happen on 40 nanometers. 
and AMD had yet another new, very long instruction word for architecture. Cypress and the previous chips were VLIW5, but AMD had to give up performance and an unknown number of features to get there. And at 389 square millimeters, it was the largest AMD GPU since their disastrous R600, but still far, far smaller than the 530 square millimeters GTX 580. And rather than trouncing the GTX 580 as expected, the 6970's performance was only more or less equal to the GTX 570. With the author, Ryan Smith, also noting that, it's interesting to see just how much NVIDIA and AMD's power consumption and performance under gaming has converged, as it used to be much more lopsided in AMD's favour. And if Cayman was the beginning of the end of AMD's dominance, the real end was coming next at 28 nanometers. Once again, AMD were first on the new node, launching the Tahiti GPU, the HD7970 and HD7950 graphics cards at the tail end of 2011. Tahiti was 365 square millimetres, so in between the size of the HD5870 and the HD6970, but on the new 28 nanometer node. Performance though was nothing special, coming in only around 20% faster than the GTX 580 and just under 40% faster than their own previous flagship 6970. Under normal circumstances, this would have been an easy win for NVIDIA and their huge die strategy, but NVIDIA were forced to change that strategy after their Fermi disaster. No longer would they be going huge die first on a new node, they would be going mid-range first. So the expectation was that NVIDIA would launch a GTX 660, performance-wise coming in a bit behind AMD's 7970, but both having perhaps similar die sizes or thereabouts. That was the expectation, but it wasn't what happened. Charlie over at semi released an article claiming Nvidia had won this generation easily. And that something very unexpected was about to happen became clear when Nvidia started talking in very bold terms about how mediocre the 7970 was. The 7970 was mediocre. But given how many bad architectures NVIDIA had launched over the past four years, they weren't ones to talk, but now they were talking. Over at Nordic Hardware, where apparently a higher up at NVIDIA was unimpressed by the performance of the 7970, saying that they honestly expected more from our competitors' new architecture. Charlie then launched another article saying he had seen benchmarks where Kepler, a much smaller, much more power efficient GPU than Tahiti, blew past an overclocked 580 by unbelievable margins while easily beating out the 7970. And the GTX 660 didn't launch first after all. Nvidia were faster, so they launched the GTX 680 instead. It was the same chip, GK104, a GPU built for the mid-range but branded and sold as the high-end GTX 680. And the tech press lauded it as the new efficient champion even though it was only 29% faster than the previous GTX 580 flagship and barely 10% ahead of the 7970. And with that praise and the acceptance of poor performance increases came the beginning of the end. The beginning of the end of competition. AMD had launched yet another new architecture, like they just couldn't help themselves. VLIW4 lasted barely a year before being thrown out for GCN. Graphics core next which as we know is still AMD's GPU architecture today. Throughout this video I've talked about how risky it is to be early on a new node. It did work for AMD at 55 nanometers and at 40 nanometers, though 40 nanometers was more down to their engineering excellence than mere chance. It backfired badly at 32 nanometers, which was cancelled. Now at 28 nanometers, AMD, who were wary of TSMC's record early on in a new node, opted for greater tolerance levels on the chips. Dave Bauman, product manager at ATI, he said as much over at the Beyond 3D forums, basically suggesting that AMD had gone conservative with Tahiti on both redundancy and clock speeds. A conservative chip on a new process and a brand new architecture? GCN was a lot different from anything that had gone before from ATI, and the drivers were in poor shape. It is not hard to see why the performance improvement over the last generation was mediocre. But think about this. In most other industries, being first is usually a good thing, right? But not necessarily when it comes to semiconductor manufacturing, 
and had AMD not been first with their larger GPU, Kepler, the GTX 680, was only 294 square millimeters and by rights should have launched before the 7970. But because AMD's engineers had more experience on new nodes, they were generally just faster in getting to the new node. But had Nvidia actually been first to the new node, as they should have been with a smaller chip, they would never have dared launch the GTX 660 chip, GK104, as the GTX 680, because they would have expected AMD to be much faster with their 7970. And the last thing that Nvidia could afford was to have their flagship card lose to AMD. Think about what they did with Fermi. They basically overclocked Fermi to its limits, the GTX 480, in order just to win, regardless of power draw. All throughout Nvidia's existence, they were launching massive chips, ever since ATI dared to take them head on with the large, at the time, R300. Nvidia never lost again for long, simply because they had huge chips. And their X80 class of GPU became rightly known as the fastest GPU money could buy. They would never risk losing that to AMD. But now, the perfect storm of AMD's completely new architecture and their concerns over TSMC's node maturity ended up with them launching a card that was just not fast enough out of the blocks. Nvidia knew they had it beaten, and that is all that mattered. Had AMD not launched anything, Nvidia would never have got away with the GTX 680 name. The press would have pilloried it as not fast enough. It wasn't even 30% faster than the 580, which was in itself absolutely nothing special. But it beat AMD's flagship, and that is what mattered. Of course, Tahiti's drivers matured, and AMD also launched a 7970 GHz edition, which they should have launched at first. And of course, they were soon back in the lead. But it was too late. The damage was done. By the end of the year, the GTX 680 had outsold the 7970 by 2 to 1. In order to really understand the long-term impact of this, look at this chart going back over the years. It's a chart of NVIDIA's mid-range GPUs. The only non-mid-range chip there is the 250 GTS. We know it's not mid-range because it ends with a 2, while the rest end in 4, with the 4 signifying mid-range for NVIDIA. It was just a die-shrunk rebranded 8800 GTX from two years previously, and obviously the 250 GTS was flogged at mid-range prices because AMD's 4870 and 4850 were better cards. With prices hovering around the 200 mark and $250 maximum, that was what we were paying for mid-range GPUs back then. Then, suddenly, with the GTX 680, 500 bucks. Look at the die sizes. It is right in the middle of Nvidia's historical mid-range. This is simply a mid-sized GPU with a mid-range codename and high-end naming and price. Performance wasn't anything special compared to previous generations either. Looking at tech power-ups charts, the 680 was 69% faster than the previous mid-range 560 Ti. We'll skip over the 461GB, as that was the broken Fermi. But looking at how much faster the 560 Ti was versus the 250 GTS isn't quite so easy, as it's not in this chart. However, we can see from an earlier chart that the GTS 450 is just slightly faster than the 250. Let's just call that a tie. And going back to the 560 Ti review, we can see that the 560 Ti is still over twice as fast. The GTS 250 was 52% faster than the 9600 GT. Those are essentially the same series of card, however, the 9000 series which was a die shrunk 8000 series. The 9600 GT was 81% faster than the 8600 GTS. There was nothing special about the GTX 680, other than it beat a poor Fermi flagship, the 580, by slightly more than usual for the mid-range chip. And of course it beat AMD's conservative driver immature Tahiti. Nvidia basically got rewarded for Fermi being bad and AMD engineers being first to the new node with another new architecture. Had AMD not been first on 28 nanometers, had TSMC's 32 nanometers not been cancelled, had any one of a number of things just happened slightly differently, Nvidia would never have gotten away with this. What really matters is of course money. Looking through Nvidia's financial history is quite revealing. They were always a company that made a lot of money when they were winning well. For example, in 2007 here, we see good results because the 8000 series were amazing cards. However, they only barely lost a little money when they were losing badly and something else had gone wrong. For example, 
having to pay a fortune in settlements due to Bumpgate, and also when the economy crashed. It took all of that for NVIDIA to actually not make a profit. In fact, even during the end of the Fermi period, they were making a lot of money. As we can see here, 2011. The Kepler effect and onward would only have started in 2013. It may seem counterintuitive that revenue and profits dropped in 2013, but in fact, if you look closer at the numbers, we can see that the GPU segment, which is mostly gaming GPU, was actually increasing. They were just losing money elsewhere in their business, i.e. with Tegra. Anand said way back in the RV870 story that instead of dedicating engineers to process technology, NVIDIA chooses to put more of its resources into architecture design. The flip side is true at ATI. ATI is much less afraid of new process nodes and thus devotes more engineering resources to manufacturing. And he believed that neither approach was the right one. They both have their trade-offs. You know, a few years ago, I'd have said that being first to the new node was more important, but it's clearly not the case. NVIDIA were almost never first, but that didn't make them lose so hard that they were basically defeated. AMD, on the other hand, basically were defeated by Kepler and the 680 because they were first to the new node. I think the important question to ask is, what did AMD ever gain out of it? Once perhaps at 40 nanometers, when they learned a lot about TSMC's mistakes, and while they capitalized on it, sort of, it wasn't really long before Nvidia were back on top of it, even with Fermi. You have to understand that AMD's 50% market share gains came at a time when they were in complete control. Nvidia couldn't even get 1% yield, the rumors went, on Fermi. They basically had to fight AMD with previous generation cards for almost a year. Yet AMD only got half the market, selling their cards at cheaper prices. They just never made any real money. I think looking at the whole story today compared to even two years ago and the GPU war is over, knowing more of the details at a deeper level, you have to say that yes, well, AMD slash ATI were unlucky in a lot of cases, they also need to take a lot of the blame. The 6970 was a disappointing card and it would have been disappointing on 32 nanometers as well. They simply were not even close to being aggressive enough with that chip and completely let Nvidia off the hook. The 5870 was so close to Fermi that AMD's own Fermi-sized GPU would have crushed anything that Nvidia could muster. That was their big chance and they blew it. I can't believe I'm actually going to say this, but maybe AMD were too innovative as well. New architectures basically every year between 2007 and 2011. So that's new driver issues every year as well. All the while, NVIDIA, they got away with rebranding G80. AMD clearly had the technological advantage for a lengthy period, but some of the choices they made were just poor. But I think the way in which the technological expertise all turned around was telling. With Pascal, NVIDIA were first to 16 nanometers or 14 nanometers, and with a larger GPU. That was something that they hadn't done in maybe a decade or more. But even before then, they were clearly doing it right, making the right choices. Everybody knew that 28 nanometers would be a long lasting node, because 20 nanometers wasn't suitable for GPU. NVIDIA made the right choice in starting off with Kepler, and then another new gaming architecture with Maxwell halfway through the 28 nanometer node. AMD on the other hand, they were now the ones rebranding. The 7970 became the 288, the 7870, shit, that was rebranded twice. That was a writing on the wall before Pascal even launched. Pascal, the GTX 1080, another mid-range GPU at higher than high-end prices, and Nvidia's revenue and profits just went through the roof. Remember that chart earlier with all those mid-range GPUs where I showed the Kepler 680? It was nothing special compared to previous mid-range GPUs. And there's a final chart with the 980 and the 1080. There was never anything not mid-range in performance about the 1080, the 980 or the 680. In fact, on average, the increase over those seven cards is 71%. So those latter three are all actually slightly below the average increase. The only difference was the naming and the astronomical increase in pricing. And of course now the 280 just launched at an even higher price and only 30% faster. But hey, it looks like AMD are gonna rebrand Polaris again. So what would you rather have? The point of these videos, I'm not even sure about. It's another history lesson which means it's been worthwhile by default.
but it should also be a wake-up call to some people who believe that this is something AMD can suddenly turn around with Navi or something else. It's true they have a very competent leader, one David Wang, you remember from earlier. Yep, the same guy who figured out TSMC's 40 nanometer problems and how to get around it, while well, Nvidia couldn't. But make no mistake about it, the Radeon Technology Group's problems are many and varied. Just being faster than Nvidia, which to be quite frank seems impossible, even with Turing's much smaller percentage improvement, being faster alone won't be enough, because Nvidia holds all the cards. RTX is an easily wielded weapon, just like Gameworks always has been. How are you going to deal with that, David? If you don't have an answer to that, you're going to lose no matter what. And then of course we have the other option, which doesn't bear thinking about. What if AMD don't even care anymore? You saw how much effort they put into this over all those years. All basically for nothing. Gaming graphics were high priority for AMD for a long time. But now, AMD is a company, guys. Money is all they care about. And clearly, they appear to have a lot more lucrative avenues than gaming graphics. In order to win it, you need to show up for the fight. But Wang did say that we'd see new architectures every year, just like before. New graphics products every year via a new architecture, process changes, or maybe incremental architecture changes. That alone sounds a lot better than what we've had from RTG for the past seven years at least. And I do have it on pretty good authority that AMD is spending a lot of the Zen money on GPU again. Wang also said, which was basically a repeat of what Raja said a year previously, that AMD had lost momentum in terms of gaining mindshare in the consumer enthusiast space. I think you know that we lost momentum in all of the media, spending all of our energy in chasing AI. Before finishing with, what I'm trying to say is that we want to go back to the cadence to make this business more fun. So say we all. But that's me done with this one. As always, check out my links in the description below. If you haven't already, please do read the entire Anantech articles that I have talked about in this video. They really are something else. And there's plenty more in there that I didn't cover in this video. And of course, if you haven't already, don't forget to like and subscribe. I'll catch you later, guys.